Well, it's good to see you all here in Brussels, but I also greet the thousands and the tens of thousands who are following this rally throughout the world. Now, I think it is important to understand that the tyrants, oppressive authority, they want the world to know about the fate of the Nelson Mandela's. They wanted South Africa to know all about Robben Island. And in Turkey, the Turkish authorities want the Kurds to know all about Imrali Island, where Abdullah Öcalan has been kept in isolation for 23 years. They want the world to know about this, and they want the world to know about the fate of Julian Assange in Belmars. Because they want us to learn a lesson. They want us to receive the warning but there is a limit, there is a limit when the wave of protest rises to the extent that it becomes out of control, then tables are turned, then the oppressor gets afraid. And this is what is happening now, and we are witnessing here in Belgium, in Brussels, and throughout the world, that the wave of protest and the demands for the release of Julian Assange is rising, and in the end, he will be freed, of course. And I want to tell you a little story about my own life. I started my working life as a journalist on Icelandic state television. I started in the late 1970s and worked there until the close of the 80s. At that time, we received film footage of events abroad by flight. We got the films sent to Iceland twice a week. And when the footage received, we received it, it was out of date. The train crash in Spain, nobody died. It was no news. And the OPEC meeting, also happening that day, no decision was made on the price of oil. But what we could do with the film material is to use it as footage for our analysis. And what we would do, we would read articles, periodicals, books. We would plow through this to get information to throw light on the events and developments. Now in the middle of the 1980s, all this changed. Now the satellites could provide us with news of recent events, if not direct. And then the train crash in Spain and the OPEC meeting was on our screens. Not because they were important news, but they were fast news. And those who could provide fast news news from today, the last hour, they also gained control over us. Now what has happened since is that the concentration of control has increased. There are fewer providers and also in the world of social media, which many of us believed would set us free, the controllers there are getting more concentrated and they are getting fewer. 
these owners of the media, of the providers, are now working hand in hand with state power preventing what they call disorder, fake news. And there is a lot of fake news around. Fake news is a reality. But the problem is to find out who is faking and who is telling the truth. We, for instance, we know that during the war, we receive a lot of fabricated news. There is a lot of lies around. And gradually it dawns upon us that it is the state or state and corporate power, those who own and control the media, who are doing much of the faking. This, of course, is nothing new. More than 2,000 years ago, the Roman philosopher and statesman Cicero said that in times of war, the law was silent. Inter arma enim silent leges. And we might add, so does the truth. Also, the truth is silenced. George Bush Jr. may not have been a philosopher. Nor Dick Cheney, Rumsfeld, Bolton, or Condoleezza Rice. But they all understood Cicero's dictum when they declared global war on terrorism. This enabled them to do things which hitherto were not possible. Enact law on home security, have their Guantanamos and spy on all those who were seen to be a terrorist threat. And such a threat was seen to be everywhere. Wherever there was a critical voice, remember, we are at war. Across the Atlantic in Russia, Vladimir Putin was thrilled as he was fighting what he called the terrorist threat in Chechnya and elsewhere in the vast lands of Russia at the time. He said he was at one with George Jr. and wanted to join NATO. But soon NATO became busy invading Afghanistan, and then Iraq was invaded, and later came regime change, and attempts at regime change in other countries. And furthermore, we not only had Guantanamo, but also the mentality of Guantanamo namely silencing critical voices and critical information which was seen to disturb the global war on terrorism. Because remember, in war, the law must be subdued, silenced. And gradually, the entire globe was in fact silenced. Not entirely, but to a very significant degree. It is into this world Julian Assange's steps towards the close of the first decade of this century with the establishment of WikiLeaks. He steps into a world which is being increasingly subjected to an ever more powerful torrent of fake news, or no news at all, a silent world fighting a global threat. With WikiLeaks, the silence was broken. And think about it. When WikiLeaks broke the silence, nobody contested what it said. Nobody said it was fake. Not even CIA Director Pompeo could say that, only that WikiLeaks were saying things that should not be said. And here we come to the crux of the matter. Julian Assange's crime was to tell the truth, 
break the silence. Julian Assange blew the whistle waking up the world. That was his crime. Not only did he bring us documented news of war crimes in Afghanistan, in Iraq and elsewhere, but he brought to our attention shady deals in the financial world and the irresponsible disposal of hazardous waste in the lands of poor nations. And had it not been for Julian Assange and later those who have carried the WikiLeaks banner, we would not have known at the time of the TISA negotiations, CETA and TTIPs, all those behind the scenes deals where states were giving away democratic rights to corporate power. Right up to this day, WikiLeaks has steadfastly kept on in this tradition. I mentioned Libya and the falsification reports on Syria at the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons. And I repeat, never has there been leveled accusations that the information provided by WikiLeaks was wrong, fake, fabricated. Never. The documents and reports have only been contested because states and corporate institutions wanted them not to be heard of. They found the whistle of the whistleblowers disturbing. They did not want the world to be woken up. So what to do? The solution is obvious. You break the whistle. You break the whistle. This is why Julian Assange is in prison. He had to be silenced, his whistle blow broken, and what is more, by breaking his whistle, all whistleblowers would be given a message, would be given a warning. And this is why we are here, to demand that Julian Assange be set free. We do this because he is being seriously mistreated, he is being tortured. And we demand his freedom because he has been deprived of rights that we regard as rights common to all men, namely human rights. And by breaking his whistle, we are being deprived of access to information, to a free press, a freely spoken word, the preconditions of a free society. This is why all around the world, people are standing up in the defense of a man who is being punished for exposing war crimes, for exposing the handing away of democratic rights to corporate power, for exposing fabricated news. We are standing up for a man who is being punished for providing us with the truth. The fate of Julian Assange is our common responsibility, the responsibility of all those who want to stand up for freedom and democracy. This is why we demand that Julian Assange be set free, that he be set free now.